Hello and welcome to our Making a Meaning series. This is session one, Ecological and Environmental Art, Creativity for the Planet. This is presented by Margaret Lejeune. Uh, my name is Donald Hyatt. This program is presented from Rochester Public Library Arts Division. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, Margaret is an image maker, educator, and independent curator originally from Rochester, New York. She holds an MFA from Visual Studies Workshop. Her practice, creative practice examines art, science, and plant-based, place-based research. In 2023, Margaret was named the Woman Science Photographer of the Year by the Royal, Photogra Royal Photographic Society in the UK. She currently serves as the Bestow Artist in Residence at the Central Michigan University and is a member of the Board of Directors for the Society for Photographic Education. And with that, I will leave it to Margaret to begin our session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining us here today. In this session, we're gonna look at works of artists who are interested in a variety of environmental issues, including sustainability, land rights, ecological concerns, climate change, and environmental restoration. Let's see here, here we go. But first we're gonna look, uh, we're gonna do a brief overview of landscape and environmental art throughout art history. Cause I feel like we can sort of posit what is happening today in the 20th and 21st centuries with environmental art if we have a better understanding of what has happened throughout history. So since first, you know, since early humans illustrated images on the interior walls of caves, Artists have been entranced with depicting our natural environment. Yet for centuries, the landscape's appearance in art was meant to convey either a sense of awe for the natural world or to act as a background subject for documentation of human narratives. Those might be religious stories or mythology, uh, allegories, things of that nature. In the 20th century, uh, alongside rising global concerns surrounding the state of the environment's health, and our impact as humans upon it, many artists started creating works in collaboration with the physical world to draw attention to ecological issues, as well as our relationship and contribution to them. As a more defined concept, environmental art has gained more traction since the 1990s, when artists began to think about their surroundings, not just in terms of lived or built space, but as a cohesive system in which humans have been playing a central part. So I'm going to start with these two images on the screen right here. Um, these are images that might come to mind from art history that are landscapes. The image on the left is by Giorgione and represents the idea I just mentioned of the landscape as background for a human narrative. In this painting, which is titled The Tempest, we read the landscape both literally and metaphorically. The storm seems to reflect the tension between the figures in the foreground, who we haven't positively identified, but some art, art historians link these characters to the Christian story of the flight into Egypt or a mythological story. The colors are subdued and the lighting is soft, greens and blues dominate. The landscape is not a mere backdrop, but forms a notable contribution to early landscape painting. The painting has kind of a silent, if you will, atmosphere, which continues to fascinate modern viewers. The image on the right-hand side is a beautiful example of art meant to convey a sense of awe in the landscape. This painting of the Grand Canyon by Thomas Moran shows the vast expansiveness of this famous national park. It's conveyed on this enormous panoramic scale. The, the canvas is seven by 10 feet. Uh, Moran was a leader in the Hudson River and Rocky Mountain schools. He was an American painter that was so entranced by Colorado's really dangerous, beautiful, unspoiled terrain that he immersed himself deeply in the landscape where few people had ventured before him. And he painted more than 30 scenes capturing this unique and sublime landscape. Observing with fascination this great open space before him, he wrote that its tremendous architecture fills one with wonder and admiration and its color and form and atmosphere are so ravishingly beautiful that however well-traveled one may be, a new world is open to him when he gazes into the Grand Canyon. So we'll come back to these concepts of landscape as awe as awe-inspiring or sublime, and then landscape as background for religious or mythology as we move forward through the first half of this lecture. So let's jump all the way back 
in time to essentially the beginning of what we call art history, right? The history of art. In the painted caves of Western Europe, namely in France and in Spain, we witnessed some of the earliest unequivocal evidence of the human's capacity to interpret and give meaning to our surroundings or to our environment. So through these achievements, these beautiful achievements in representation and some abstraction actually, we see a newfound mastery of the environment and a revolutionary accomplishment into the intellectual development of humankind. The painted walls of the interconnected series of caves at Lascaux in Southern France are among the most impressive and well-known art uh, creations of the Paleolithic humans. Although there is one human image painted, Representations of humans in the painted form are very rare in caves, but sculpted forms of humans are more common during that period. Most of the paintings depict animals found in the surrounding landscape, such as horses, bison, mammoths, ibex, deer, etc. The depicted animals would comprise of animals uh, that would have been hunted and eaten, such as the deer and the bison, as well as those that were feared as predators, such as the lions and the bears and the wolves. No vegetation or illustration of the environment is portrayed around the animals who are represented typically in profile and often standing in very alert and sort of energetic stances. Most of the paintings are located at a distance from the cave's entrance and many of the chambers are not easily accessible. The placement of these images together with their enormous size and really compelling grandeur, suggests that the remote chambers may have served as sacred or ceremonial meetings places. And I love to think about in the absence of natural light that these works could have been only created by the aid of torches or stone lamps that were filled with animal fat. So these early images start our journey throughout history as humans choose to depict through various forms of art, their complex and sometimes fraught relationships with nature. Here we're looking at effigy mounds. Uh, these are earthworks in the shapes of animals and birds. Um, these were raised in North America in areas that are now corresponding to the states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, uh, and Ohio. And most of the effigy mounds are profile images of animals, seldom more than six feet high. They often include felines, bears, uh, deer, and they suffered considerably with the increase in farming settlements in the 19th century, um, when many of the ancient Native American mounds were plowed under. Fortunately, the extraordinary size and recognizable depictions saved many of these mounds, including this one here. This may be the grandest representation of a mound. It depicts an undulating snake, perhaps a stylized rattlesnake. It's in Adams County, Ohio, and it's known as the Great Serpent Mound. It's over 1,300 feet long. The average height of it is about four to five feet tall with a width of about 20 to 25 feet. And the serpent is located on a wedge shape, a slightly convex hill um, that overlooks the Bush Creek, um, this beautiful waterway. It first came to scholars' attention in the 1840s, and early researchers suggested that the very shape of the bluff upon which the serpent is worked uh, was ev evocative of a large giant reptile. So perhaps this explains the sighting of this uh, rattlesnake-like form. The exact function of these mounds is unknown. Um, there's a clay structure underneath, but there's been no culturally identifiable objects yet located within it. While burials have been found around the effigy mounds or in effigy mounds in the Northwest, none have been found at the mounds in Ohio. So the Great Serpent Mound was, you know, where the period that it was erected, we're not quite certain. You can see I've got quite a big distance of uh, dates on the slide here. It was often thought that it was made by the Adia people um, sometime between 1000 and 100 BCE, but recent archeological evidence and research suggests that it might be from a later date. And I wanted to share this image because earthworks such as this will become highly influential to 20th century artists working in a movement called land art, which we'll discuss in the second half of this presentation. According to written sources by Vitruvius in De Architectura, 
Landscapes were an established form of painting in Rome by about around the year 30 BCE, uh, before common era is the term I'm using there when I say BCE. At that point in time, home dwellings rarely incorporated views of the outside world. There were not a lot of windows. So because of this, many stylized landscapes were painted on the interior walls of houses. This allowed inhabitants to feel surrounded by the beauty of nature, even while indoors. There was a growing appreciation at this time also for gardens and botanical life. So this encouraged an increase of personal gardens at home. So Romans could get a sense of the natural landscape, um, sort of outside in their gardens, and then, you know, these depictions of the landscape through these painting paintings and frescoes um, actually in their homes. So you get this real and perceived experience with the natural world. And as we discussed in the beginning, landscape images often were um, serving as a place to depict human stories, allegories, mythology, religious history. This fresco, which is from the, the middle of the first century BCE, was found in Rome in April of 1848 during the excavation of a house. And we believe that it depicts um, books from the Odyssey. And what it did is it adorned the upper portion of a wall of a portico of a house. And that a portico would have kind of been a porch-like area. And there remained eight landscapes that were positioned in a sequence against the wall with what we call a double colonnade view. You'll notice if you look at the center of the image, there is a trompe l'oeil painted column, so fool the eye is what that term means, um, that is red with a gold cap on it. And it even has its own shadow painted in place because the artist wanted you to believe this true depth of space. The landscape in this scene really functions as a stage from which the, the scenes from the Odyssey are depicted. And it probably wasn't meant to represent an exact or specific place, but more meant to evoke the sense of place. Long before landscape art became a genre of its own right in the West, landscape art in China was, however, very well established. Um, Shan Shui refers to a style of Chinese painting that involves the painting of scenery or natural landscapes with brush and ink. The name literally translates to mountain water picture. Mountains, rivers, and waterfalls are prominent in this art form. Shan Shui painting first rose to prominence in China in the 10th and 12th centuries during the Song Dynasty. And when Chinese painters work and Shan Shui painting, they do not try to represent an image of what they've actually seen in nature, but what they have thought about nature. It's not so important whether the painted colors and shapes look exactly like the real object. The intent is more to capture on paper an awareness of an inner reality and wholeness, as though the painting flows directly from the artist's mind through the brush and onto the paper. Shang Shui painters use the same materials and essentially the same techniques as calligraphers, and their works are judged by the same criteria. Shang Shui paintings involve a complicated and rigorous set of requirements for balance, composition, and form. And each painting contains three basic elements, paths, threshold, and the heart or focal point of the image. This approach to landscape I wanted to include in the presentation because it sort of makes us think about a philosophical approach to rendering the land, which will influence many environmental artists in the 20th and 21st centuries. In North America, uh, just around you know, a similar time, we're sort of moving forward slowly through art history. Some indigenous people were creating rock art, representing deities whom they called upon for assistance to thrive in their environment. One really beautiful example of this is from the Hoiko tank uh, pictographs. These are located in El Paso, Texas, and they were created sometime between 400, or I'm sorry, 900 and 1400. Uh, um, they were probably drawn by a more sedentary farming group whose need for rain and favorable growing conditions for crops were really of a critical concern. And so we're gonna see that in the art. Um, they express these concerns typically through rituals and through the painting of sacred symbols. And if you look closely here, this figurative 
um, uh, painting seems to depict images of lightning strikes almost um, in the symbolism across what appears to be the sort of chest-like area of the figure. Um, this may have represented the Mesoamerican rain god, Talaluk, perhaps painted as an offering in hope for rain and therefore a healthy bounty. If we jump across the world uh, to what is now modern day Europe, artists uh, around this time were beginning to take a new approach to imaging their environment. Rather than stories of mythology and religion, artists began to depict scenes of work and recreation. It should be noted that the Italian Renaissance painters were still very much enamored with religious painting mythology at this time. Think of the famous works by Giotto, uh, Fra Angelico, Michelangelo, Botticelli, and I've omitted them from this presentation because I only have so much time um, and they get their fair share. <laughs> so pictured here, you're going to see um, a work by the Lindbergh brothers called from uh, the Illuminated Manuscripts, The Very Rich Book of Hours, which was created for the Duke of Berry. It's possibly the most famous and best illustrated manuscript of this time. Um, like I mentioned, it's a book of hours, which is a collection of prayers. And it contained over 200 pages with about 120 illuminations. There are calendar images, which are the ones that are most commonly reproduced. And they offer a really vivid representation of peasants performing uh, agricultural work, as well as aristocrats in formal attire set against a background of medieval architecture and scenery. The selection that I've chosen here is the month of February, and it depicts a winter scene in a peasant village that is snow covered and lays beneath a really gray sky in the background. Inside the dwelling on the left-hand side, you've got two, men, two women and a man, and they're warming themselves by an open fire. Um, and if you look really closely, all three are unabashedly lifting their garments to expose their completely nude private parts to the fire. It's always kind of a funny thing to me. And I remember Sister Wendy, the, the nun art historian, pointing this out to me when I was in school, and I thought it was quite hysterical. Um, so an enclosure surrounds the farm. It's comprised of a sheep pen. On the right-hand side, we've got four beehives, and there's also a shelter for domestic birds. In the middle ground, a man is chopping down a tree, and he's got a bundle of sticks at his feet. Um, there's also a man getting ready to go inside on the right-hand side that's in front of that birdhouse. He's blowing on his hands to warm them up. And then further in the distance, a man is driving a donkey loaded with uh, wood, toward the neighboring village. And this painting gives us a brief glimpse into how people worked the land and survived in the cold winter months in Northern France. If we jump 150 years later, but we stay in Northern Europe, we can see that landscape painting changes quite drastically. Both the works shown here are from the Northern Renaissance painter, Peter Bruegel, the elder, one work shows a strong connection to the standard depictions of religious scenes amid a supporting landscape, while the other work shows an exploration of paintings of sort of genre scenes of everyday life, okay, it's more in tune with what we just looked at from the Lindbergh brothers. So the landscape on the right, uh, which is called Landscape with the Flight into Egypt from 1563, um, typifies the landscape painting of the Northern Renaissance period. It's got this great atmospheric perspective, which you see receding into the distance into this pale blue color. Um, it combines breathtaking scenery with the religious narrative. So the tiny figures, if you look in the foreground, you see Mary and Joseph, they're teetering along on the edge of a cliff face and they're fleeing persecution in Bethlehem. The scenery is tied closely to their story as the pale distant scenery I mentioned is being left behind. And, and then in the dark, the foreboding foreground, which is very dark, right? We see them heading toward that. So they are heading into this time shrouded in darkness, the danger of the unknown. And Bruegel sought to contrast areas of stillness and motion in this image painting the rocks and mountains as steady and unmoving and constant in comparison with the constantly flowing movement of water, people, and birds in flight. 
In contrast to this, on the right-hand side, we have Hunters in the Snow, which is painted just two years later, remarkably. And it depicts a winter's day dominating a beautiful landscape with various snowy activities dispersed meticulously throughout the scene. Executed primarily in these sort of gloomy whites and murky gray colors, the topography represents a valley that has been overtaken by freezing snow with barren rugged mountains looming in the distance. The architecture in the frozen ponds show that the artist is partly, you know, sought inf inspiration from the landscape around the Netherlands, right? However, the addition of those jagged, tall mountains in the distance suggests an imaginary scene, possibly constructed based on the artist's encounter with the Alps during his journey to Italy, just shortly before this painting was made. Imbued with a plethora of details, this painting demonstrates a complexity of meaning propelling all these genre scenes we see within it. So we've got this preparation for the cold months, like the figures in the foreground of the inn, they're lighting a fire to cook a pig. There's a woman carrying sticks across a bridge. Others are really delighting in winter, right? Some of them are skating on the surface of frozen ponds and playing winter sports. In the foreground, we see three hunters. They're returning with their pack of dogs from a hunt. And some elements suggest that the catch was disappointing. Their slumped bodies, right? The body language that we see, the dog's heads are bowed. Um, and there's a rabbit trail in the snow, which seems to be missed by the hunters. Um, that might, all of this might suggest that they were not able to bring home enough food to feed their families. So this is the first European large format painting of a winter landscape. And this work is regarded by many art historians as depicting what we now know as the Little Ice Age. And this raged throughout Europe between the 15th and the 19th centuries. Although this cooling of the, the Little Ice Age varied over time and from place to place, in general, it persisted for several centuries. Global temperatures decline, declined by just a few degrees Celsius, you know, significantly less dramatic than the current warming trends we are experiencing. Nevertheless, regional effects were very severe. They included catastrophic droughts, torrential rains, entire years in which winter never really transitioned or gave way to spring or summer. It's kind of similar to what we've been experiencing now, right, around the world. And in the 17th century Low Countries, um, those areas are modern day Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, um, were provided this like striking model of how adaptive and resilient people can be in the face of the changing climate. By about 1650 or 40 or so years after this painting was made, the, this was the wealthiest um, you know, province of the Dutch Republic. It's where now modern day Netherlands are. Those folks owned collectively approximately 2.5 million paintings. And many of the paintings that they owned reflected the presence of this little ice age and recorded its consequences for ordinary people. These are stunning winter landscapes, and they seem to recreate with really plausible detail what real life gatherings might have looked like in frigid weather. The image we're looking at here is Adam Van Breen's skating on the frozen Amstel River. And it definitely shows um, you know, one of those sequences of the sort of chilly winters uh, that were happening in the low country at that time. Although, there were other forces than climate change that influenced how artists chose and depicted their subjects. Icy landscapes do shed light on how the Dutch adapted to a cooler climate during this period. The coastal low countries were crisscrossed with waterways, if you think about Amsterdam today, right? And those waterways allowed for the efficient transportation of goods and people and information. And paintings like those from uh, Van Breen and Van Goyen as seen here, accurately portray how ordinary people use things like sleds and ice skates, uh, which is a Dutch invention, to keep these transportation networks open in cold weather, to maintain crucial shipping of goods um, that were easier to send by water. Travelers even designed specialized icebreaker ships. 
Because the Little Ice Age did more than alter temperature, we can look beyond ice skate paintings to see how artists depicted the telltale weather of a changing climate. So this image here by Backhuysen, um, it's called Ships in Distress off a rocky coast, is a beautiful example of hundreds of Dutch and Flemish paintings that portray ships imperiled by storms. In the waters surrounding the, the Low Countries, such storms may have been especially severe during the, the Little Ice Age. Um, storms were often destructive for the Dutch. They shattered ships and they broke through dikes that otherwise protected the coastal Low Countries from the sea and from flooding. Yet because Dutch warships fared better in storms than their English counterparts, bad weather also offered advantages for the Dutch in a series of 17th century wars with England. Less than a hundred years later, as we continue to move forward throughout history, in England, we see a dramatically different approach to imaging the environment. One of the most famous paintings by Thomas Gainsborough is the portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. It was created in 1750, in which um, I should mention that the artist painted this when he was only 21 years old. Um, we see here the landowner, Robert, um, Robert Andrews, and his young wife, Frances Andrews, and they're sitting on a bench in front of an English countryside landscape. The portrait was commissioned in 1750. This was two years after the couple was married. So this is not a marriage portrait per se, but instead it likely celebrated uh, an inheritance that Andrews received in 1750. Thus, for some people, this painting can be considered a triple portrait. It's Mr. Andrews, his wife, and his land. So in this early work, Gainsborough prominently features a naturalistic landscape. It dominates the right-hand side of the canvas. Gainsborough was particularly fond of landscape painting. And in this case, he uses this opportunity to display his painterly skills, right? He creates the effect of changing weather in the background. You can see on the left-hand side behind Mr. Andrews, we've got a really foreboding sky. And then if we move past the tree and over to the right-hand side, we start to see the clouds breaking and a blue sky wanting to pop through. In the century between when this was created and 1850, um, the British landscape painters really reimagined a radical way of depicting the landscape. These painters include Turner and Constable, and they just mapped Britain as this sublime country. They invented the idea of art as an intensely subjective confrontation with nature. So here's an example from Constable. Landscape painting gained prominence as a genre in the late 18th century with the rise of Romanticism. For some artists, it became a method to express their response to rapid urbanization in the Enlightenment era, as well as changes to the landscape due to the Industrial Revolution. So pastoral paintings, which is one of three approaches that depicted landscape during the um, the Romantic era principally celebrated humanity's taming of nature. That is to say our dominion over the natural world. So in this work here called Flatford Mill, it's a good example of this idea of the dominion or the sort of ownership or taming of nature. Constable's family had a water mill on the Store River for grinding corn and a dry dock for building barges to transport the grain as well as a water mill upstream. And the passages up and down the river required the use of horse-drawn barges. The ropes had to be disconnected in order to allow the barges to be pulled under the Flatford Bridge. So in this picture, what we see is a boy disconnecting the rope and another who's sitting astride um, a, a tow horse. And by depicting the work along the river, Constable shows, again, this taming of the natural environment in the name of industrial progress. In contrast to Constable, uh, painters such as de Lutherberg sought to explore the notion of this sublime landscape that I mentioned previously. These works focus primarily on the sheer awe and power of the natural world. Nature, as these artists saw it, heeds warning against those who wish to go against it, such as the industrialists, with the implication that within nature is the wrath of God. 
Um, this painting is called An Avalanche in the Alps. It was painted in 1803, and it demonstrates this through a really stark contrast between the enormous jagged cliff face and the tiny, tiny figures that you see in the foreground cowering from this lethal threat of the avalanche. The, um, the painter was British-based but French-born, and he painted this work at a time when the picturesque yet very dangerous French Alps were an increasingly popular embodiment of the sublime landscape. Here in the distance, the French mountains are beginning to crumble away, falling into an avalanche, casting this terrifying huge billowing cloud of dust and smoke across the scene and obscuring the sky above. A flash of white light in the center draws our eye to the tiny figures, um, the, the onlookers, who are minuscule in the face of the falling rock around them and soon to be destroyed by the elemental force of nature. Continuing to move forward, during the late 19th century came the birth of early modern landscape painting, beginning with the Impressionist movement. The invention of transportable oil paint tubes meant that artists were no longer confined to the studio. As a result, scenery painting en plein air or outdoors became popularized and it allowed artists to paint at any moment of inspiration. So impressionist paintings don't necessarily focus on capturing every detail of the landscape. Instead, they capture the energy of the scene portraying key elements such as light and color and shadow. And I put these two very distinctly different images um, together here because I wanted you to see the transition of Claude Monet's style from 1867 on the left to you know, the beginning of the 1900s on the right-hand side. It's a dramatically different approach to painting. A really interesting study uh, came out that was recently published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it analyzes the changes in style and color in nearly 100 paintings by Claude Monet and Turner, who are known for their impressionistic art style. Uh, they lived during Western Europeans' Industrial Revolution, um, which took place in the 18th and 19th centuries, and this study found that over time, as industrial air pollution increased throughout Turner and Monet's careers, skies in their paintings became hazier too. According to one of the atmospheric scientists, uh, Anna Albright, um, she said that the impressionistic painters are known to be quite ex extensively sensitive to changes in light in the environment it makes sense that they would be very sensitive not only to natural changes in the environment, but also man-made changes in the environment. So the early industrial revolution transformed the skies of London and Paris, these painters' hometowns in unprecedented ways, ways we had never seen before. Coal burning factories increased employment opportunities, but obscured the atmosphere with harmful pollutants. Um, those include things like sulfur dioxide. And these, I wanted to show you these two images here of Char Crossing Bridge uh, series because the, the scientists from that study estimated that you could only see about one kilometer away. That was the furthest visible object on the haziest days during this time period. So, well, Turner and, and Monet were creating this new style, right? This, these new kinds of brushworks, these daubs of paint where things become much more impressionistic, right? On the canvas. They're also responding to what is happening in their environment, what is happening in their atmosphere. According to another one of the scientists who were working on this study, um, a professor from Harvard University, he said that impressionism is often contrasted with realism, but our results in this study highlight that Turner and Monet's impressionistic work also captures a certain sense of reality, specifically that they seem to have realistically shown how sunlight filters through smoke, smog, and clouds. Okay, so that concludes our brief history of artists um, who have worked with the environment and the landscape before the modern era. The second half of this lecture is going to focus on um, mid 20th century artists through contemporary and how their works investigate and collaborate with the environment. 
So we're going to begin um, talking about land art or earth art. This was a very important part of um, the 1960s and 70s. It was an avant-garde art movement. It was pioneered by American artists. It was developed through the movement of minimalism, which really championed a, a simplicity as a way of uh, like this in like as a way that artists were thinking about this increased frustration with the control and hierarchy of the mainstream art world. So it had a lot in common with conceptual art in its prioritizing of process over execution. Many young artists at this time were bothered by the restriction of the gallery space. And the counterculture movement was encouraging individuals to rethink structures of power, right? how to successfully operate outside of them. So artists began looking for spaces in urban wastelands, in deserts, to host different kinds of work, some of surprising composition and size. And this is one of those monumental works that mark this period. It's Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. Uh, it was created in 1970, and it's really considered to be one of the pivotal pieces of land art. The northern section of the Great Salt Lake, where Smithson chose to site the spiral jetty, had been cut off from fresh water supplies when a nearby causeway uh, was constructed by one of the railroad companies in 1959. This encouraged the water's unique red-violet coloration that we see here. Um, and Smith, Smithson particularly liked this combination of colors because he thought it evoked a sense of ruins and polluted sci-fi sort of landscape. And by inserting the, the spiral jetty into this damaged section and using entirely natural materials native to the area, Smithson really calls attention to this environmental blight. Nevertheless, he also sought to reference the importance of time eroding and transforming our environment. So the coiling structure of this piece was inspired by the, the growth pattern of crystals, uh, you know, also by the form of, uh, that we see on um, uh, seashells, right? This Fibonacci sequence, right? So while it resembles this symbol that we're very familiar with, making it in the landscape seemed quite futuristic. Uh, Smithson, along with other artists such as Nancy Holt, Michael Heiser, Walter Di Maria, all of them are creating work using stone, rock, sand, and they're all part of this uh, land art movement. This is Michael Heiser's double negative work. Um, it consists of two massive trenches that are cut into a mesa in the Nevada desert, and it carries with it a sense of implicit violence, violence in nature. As Heiser himself describes it, quote, double negative is really a scar of a kind an intrusion of nature, an assault of some sort. It's as though a surgeon took an exploratory cut of a mesa to show its innards, unquote. Well, as you can imagine, if you're sort of thinking about both of these artists that I just showed you, you may have some questions about how are these artists really working with nature and thinking about the long-term effects of the projects that they're building. English writer and painter Adrian Henri wrote, if the major works of the new art, uh, uh, earth art movement are American, then Holland seems to be the natural home for environmental art. For Henri, environmental art was much more of a European affair. Its artists were not producing enormous works of art in the desert a la Michael Heiser, like this double negative, and were not necessarily responding to the critiques of American counterculture. Instead, environmental art sought to more readily use and work in tandem with natural materials. In fact, Robert Smithson and others were critiqued, like I said, for the environmental damage they caused by their work. You know, these techniques of cutting chunks out of the earth, drilling, digging, moving heavy equipment out into these relatively unspoiled landscapes did not adequately demonstrate a concern for the impact on humans or on the nature, natural environment. These critiques, though, were born out of an emerging worldwide environmental consciousness. Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring, documented the impact of pesticides on the natural world. 
It predicted the impact of the use and accruement of harmful chemicals in insects and animals and made suggestions for pesticide alternatives and pest reducing strategies. The book had a huge impact on the public consciousness about the influence of human beings in the natural world and saw the formation of several environmental justice and campaign groups. In 1970, Richard Nixon's government established the Environmental Protection Agency as a means of addressing many of the concerns raised by Carson's text. That same year saw the creation of Earth Day, celebrated annually on the 22nd of April. That day was created in order to draw attention to the wide variety of environmental challenges facing our globe. The first Green Parties were also established around the same time in order to uh, take concerns voiced by these environmental groups um, into mainstream politics. So since then, climate change and global warming have become increasingly central to the manifestos of other political parties, as scientists warn of the very serious impact environmental change will have on the day-to-day -day lives of people around the globe. Evolving out of land art, environmental art also rethinks the importance of exhibition space and really seeks other places where art can happen. Um, this form of institutional critique really seeks to question authority and the power of museums and galleries that have historically controlled the production, sale, and viewing of art, right? Who has access? Who has access to this work is what artists were asking. By looking for new and sometimes surprising locations, artists not only remove the power from high-powered art dealers, buyers and the art market in general, but also question the need for an audience and art buyers. That's a really interesting concept at the time. Instead, artists are emphasizing the birth of an idea and the process of a creation without insisting that the work needs to be seen by many people or indeed by anyone at all in this case of Betty Bo uh, Beaumont's work here. This work, Ocean Landmark, is a deeply social, socially conscious work, often active, uh, actively highlighting sustainability and engaging with contemporary issues. Beaumont was looking for a way to take waste material from a power plant and transform it into something that would actively benefit the environment. She collaborated with a team of scientists in order to create a work of art that actually lays on the Atlantic Ocean floor, about 40 miles off the uh, New York Harbor. By taking this coal waste and reforming it into inert blocks, she was able to fashion what has become an artificial reef deep under the sea. Though viewers are unable to view this piece because of its location, um, New York University actually created an interactive telecommunications program, virtual reality piece, that could allow you to experience the sculpture in the year 2000. They, they created that. The installation has become a fish haven. It's really become very successful underwater for creating this beautiful environment for fish and coral to grow. So. The work asks profound questions about the possibility of conceptual art to have a positive impact on our environment. In her preparatory work uh, with scientists and engineers, she showed how integrating artistic practice um, with environmental science can create this new experimental ecology, right? By fusing art and science practice together, she broke down this divide between these disciplines and suggests a new cross-disciplinary mode of working particularly in the solving of pressing problems such as repurposing and recycling waste materials from industry. Environmental artists often use natural materials such as leaves, flowers, branches, um, ice, um, sand, stone um, as the basis of their work. Uh, moreover, in choosing to situate their work in certain places, environmental artists seek to both transform the site that is in the way the site is viewed, um, you know, what is already there in the landscape. This demands the viewers and audience rethink how they see the world around them and pay more attention to the minute and distinct parts that make up what we may overlook as a cohesive environment. The artist that you see here working is Andy Goldsworthy, and he's famed for um, his celebration of organic materials, his use of pattern and shape and texture in his work. Um, he really likes to explore the sort of inner 
beauty of the environment and think about cycles like rebirth and decay and this idea of co-creation between man and natural materials. Um, this work was created in um, Cumbria, England in 1985 and referenced some uh, something called the Nine Standards, which are these ancient cairns that sit in the landscape nearby. Here's a couple other of Andy Goldsworthy's work. Photography plays a really crucial role um, in his process because most of his work is ephemeral in nature. So it will dissolve, melt, fall apart over time. And he really uses photography to capture uh, the work. When uh, another artist who uses natural materials like that um, is Agnes Dennis. And she used seeds in this work called Wheatfield, A Confrontation. Um, this was created in New York City in 1982. She bought a vacant lot in Lower Manhattan um, and she planted two acres of golden wheat in this space. It was supported by a grant from the Public Art Fund and she cleaned the area and then brought in 200 truckloads of topsoil finally installing an irrigation system to support the wheat's growth. Um, and the wheat grew over a four month period. And then the artist harvested over a thousand pounds of grain from this work, which then traveled to 28 cities worldwide in an exhibition she titled, The International Art Show for the End of World Hunger. She planted and harvested a wheat field on land that is worth $4.5 billion in a city where in the background you could see the the buildings of wall street right this project was a symbol of uh, that represented food energy commerce world trade and economics but it also talked about mismanagement waste world hunger and ecological concerns it really called attention to some of our misplaced priorities in contrast to the work that I just showed you, I wanted to talk about an artist who brings nature into the gallery space. This image by um, Meg Webster, she usually brings in uh, sort of gardens, flowers, plants, peat, uh, and other you know, dirt into the gallery. These works are not meant to merely reflect the English countryside where she grew up. Um, but instead, through the use of light and heat and organic material, she actively changes the ambient temperature and humidity in the gallery with her recreations of ecosystems. This piece here called Moss Bed Queen, we see the influence of minimalist art, right, in its simple representation of a rounded rectangle of peat moss and soil. The material which it is made from is the very building blocks of our life, right? Um, they're the starting point for everything that feeds us and all living things. Though this point may sound really obvious, by shaping this natural material in such an understated way, she's exposing the underlying and ever-present magic of the natural process that unobtrusively takes place perpetually all around us. Yet by bringing it into the gallery space, she's also emphasizing its importance and in inviting viewers to consider something ordinarily ignored as something worthy of being art. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, more environmental artists started to consider the actual legacy and impact of art in the environment and how their works could actively draw attention to specific issues occurring in otherwise unseen or unrecorded places. The term ecovention was coined by artist curator Sue Spade and curator Amy Lipton. And it's used to define art that had a much more specific function than simply representing an idea, but that was an intervention of some kind to aid in the improvement of a particular issue. This lightwork installation we see here comprised of three um, synchronized lines of light shining on buildings and the surrounding landscape. It was created off the Hebrides, uh, on the Hebride Islands um, off the coast of Scotland. It's by two Finnish artists, and it, it really wrapped around the structures along the base of a mountain landscape. And based on their scientific data, again, a, um, a group of artists who is collaborating with scientists, 
using the scientific data of um, sea level rise, everything that is below this line of light that they have created through the installation will be underwater in the next 40 years. So what they're doing is they're trying to visualize for us the future if we continue to treat the planet as we are treating it now. Um, this artist, uh, uh, German, this is a German artist, um, Nies Udo. He's a very prolific environmental artist. He started working in the 1960s. He's still working today. Um, this enormous bird nest was built in the botanical gardens of Clemson University, and it was built with the help of students and volunteers. The installation was made out of bamboo for the interior of the nest, and local pine was sourced for the exterior of it. Um, the piece stood for two years, and then the logs were mulched and they were used to fill in the hole where the piece was created. This giant bird's nest was created by Uru to draw attention to the labor and building skills that goes into building a bird's nest. By harnessing the power of clay, normally a material used in building bricks for houses, he created a solid structure that suggests its own permanence. However, he initially chose to use untreated wood, uh, which would have invariably decay and mold and change over time. So with this piece, he's asking us to consider we as humans, how we emulate nature in our own world. Birds build with no regard for a guarantee of permanence in their homes. Um, even their residence is subject to natural forces of the climate and decay. We, on the other hand, favor building things for permanence. And he's suggesting that perhaps by paying attention to birds' faith in the natural order of things, um, that we might be encouraged to trust more in life's harmonious uh, relationship with nature. Got just a few more slides here. Um, this is a really fascinating work I love by the Danish Atlantic artist, um, Eliasson. It was, um, he, in 2018, uh, to coincide with the uh, COP24 meeting, the climate change conference, he extracted 30 blocks of glacial ice from the waters that surround Gle Greenland, and he placed them in public spaces in London, where they were left to melt. This piece was called Ice Watch, and it was a temporary installation, as you can imagine, because it's ice, and it was meant to serve as a visual reminder of the impact of climate change on the environment. There were uh, 24 pieces of ice placed outside the Tate Modern Museum, and an additional six blocks were placed outside of Bloomberg headquarters in the city of London. Uh, Eliasson really wanted this project to allow people to get up close and personal with melting ice. He said that he feared that the issue of melting glaciers was so abstract and far away. By bringing the ice to a major city where viewers could touch it, smell it, some people are photographed licking and tasting the ice, he hoped that it would create a more emotional response. He worked with a geologist uh, to transport the ice over, which was over a hundred tons um, from this fjord in Greenland. The ice had separated naturally from its sheets, naturally with climate change, um, and was discovered floating in the ocean. So he did not chisel this ice away from the glaciers. Next, we have uh, works from contemporary artists, um, uh, Sarah Black and Anne Amberg Green, um, Ginsburg, excuse me. Um, these artists also work with scientists to create interdisciplinary works that bridge art and science. In March of 2016, they cut down a tan oak tree that was infected with sudden oak death. Um, they cut this tree down in the Big Creek Reserve in California. This pathogen had traveled on the global nursery trade to the US and trees that are infected with sudden oak death are quarantined inside a boundary of their county line where they're brought into until they can be processed into lumber and kiln dried, which then kills off uh, the, the infection. So the sort of tightening of boundaries is a, a, a move toward environmental conservation, but Ginsburg and Black see this as an echo in a, a rising tide of nationalism, xenophobia, 
and boundary enforcement on a global scale. Working with these scientists and these um, wood sawyers, they milled and kilned the dried tree from wood to lumber so that it could be shipped to Chicago, where they then made it into 7,000 pencils. This is only the beginning of the project. I've seen this installation in person and they invite everyone who comes into the gallery space to pick up a pencil and make drawings with this work. So this work continues to grow and um, you know, have this ripple effect with artists. The term 7,000 marks actually refers to a Joseph Boy's work called 7,000 Oaks where the artist planted 7,000 oak trees in Germany in 1982. This work brings people together. It really asks them to think about what does it mean to be native to a place, whether human, plant, animal, or fungus. The boundaries that we draw on multiple scales, right? The cellular level, the object level, the societal and the global levels. Are these in some way fictitious, you know, fictitious, um, you know, what are our beliefs about real social and political economical consequences? How can we question uh, boundaries, reframing how we think about human migration, globalization, its effect on ecosystem stability, our fear or embrace of the other? So works like this are really multifaceted um, and while they're interdisciplinary, they're also intersectional in nature, meaning that these artists are thinking about more than the relationship between art and science. They're also thinking about all of these other uh, issues, including, um, you know, things like uh, economics, uh, religion, um, right, uh, issues of identity and such. Um, this work here was created in 2019 by Santiago Sierra. It's a durational work of multi -canvas, uh, multiple canvases um, that examines and discusses air pollution. To produce this project, he mounted um, adhesive canvas onto, or I'm sorry, he, he painted uh, this adhesive onto the canvases that he then mounted around Mexico City, which was named one of the most polluted large cities by the World Health Organization. And then he allowed the air to simply settle upon the surfaces of these canvases. And then each week he removed one of the canvases from the places that they were situated outside, and he commissioned a conservator to permanently fix the sediment filth to the surface of the painting. This resulted in a really disturbing time lapse of noxious accumulation across these canvases from week one that we can see on the left hand side, where it's sort of an off white color on the canvas to the dark brown image you see on the far right from week 52. In sampling these materials in a laboratory, the artist found that the canvases contained heavy metal, metal particulates and bacteria that's responsible for illnesses ranging from conjunctivitis to the flu, respiratory illnesses, and skin problems. From afar, the canvases generate the feeling of a minimalist right, installation, almost spiritual in its atmosphere. But up close and on the surface, the muck and stray hairs become this repellent agent of contingent, right? Or uh, that we see in this clean and whitewashed gallery. Another artist working with pollution is the photographer, Chris Jordan. His work is deeply engaged with the mass, the impact of mass consumption on the environment. In his photographic series called Midway, he captures the immediate effects of plastic pollution on the albatross uh, population that is living on the Midway Atoll. This is a remote territory in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and in these photographs, Chris Jordan has gone to Midway. He is working amongst this colony of birds. He slices open the stomachs of dead albatross and exposes the plastic rubbish that is eaten. Um, it's most of these birds have been accidentally fed this garbage by their parents who mistaken the trash for food. The body of the albatross is still recognizable in both of these images. We can see beaks, 
um, feathers, etc. But Jordan has laid out the pieces of toxic plastic in colorful juxtapositions to these sort of muted tones that we see from the baby birds. It gives us a really beautiful glimpse into the harmful effects of ignorance and negligence um, that humans are, you know, are doing, are causing. The albatross carcasses also expose how the, uh, the how insidious the climate crisis truly is. Chris Jordan says, and I quote, like the albatross, the first world humans find ourselves lacking the ability to discern anymore what is nourishing from what is toxic to our lives and our spirits. Artists around the world are responding to what's happening in our oceans. Deborah Jack works across video, collage, and photography to evoke the haunting side of Caribbean ecology. I should mention that Debbie Jack is also uh, a student who attended VSW in Rochester, um, and she is now a very successful artist. She makes works by imaging storms, coastlines, and nature to emphasize how the shore is an ongoing site of departure and arrival and a place of embrace and erosion. She incorporates her childhood memories from St. Martin, where she was raised, with the larger colonial history of the island to examine how one's cultural experiences of the land is shaped by historical factors. In this work, uh, Drowned Water Sea Drawings in Three Acts, Act One, Wait, Wait on the Water, she examines the shared vulnerabilities by climate change across ge geographic zones by overlapping footage of the tide on different coastlines in St. Martin and the Netherlands. This approach to art making emphasizes that climate change will impact everyone, no matter where they are in global social economic hierarchy. Environmental art has had a substantial impact on installation and public art in the usage of material or inspiration drawn from nature and natural events. In recent years, works by artists such as the group Random International uh, toured the world with their rain room. It's an immersive environment of perpetually falling water that pauses whenever a human body is detected. The installation offers visitors an opportunity to experience what is seemingly impossible, the ability to control rain and the weather. Rain Room presents a respite from everyday life and an opportunity for sensory reflection within a responsive relationship. If you're interested in learning more about artists like the Random International Group who are influenced by or work in tandem with weather, be sure to attend the last session of the Making and Meaning Lecture Series titled Weather as Muse, Art that Embraces Images and Collaborates with the Weather. It's scheduled for May 8th at 6.30 p.m. And for more information on that, you can register on the Rochester Public Library website. So with that, I wanna thank you for joining me today. If you uh, would like more information on environmental art and artists, I've listed a few websites here that might be of interest to you. And I'm happy now to take any questions. Um, you can drop them in the chat as Don mentioned at the beginning, or feel free to unmute yourself for a small group and uh, we can just speak freely. I'm gonna exit myself out of uh, this presentation now so I can see you all more closely. Does anyone have any questions? Were there cave drawings in China? Were there cave drawings in China? There were, there have been recent, uh, I was just reading actually today, an article uh, about cave, about um, cave paintings in Indonesia. Um, and these are actually older than the Lascaux cave paintings. They believe that these may be from uh, approximately 46,000 years ago. 
And so this is a relatively new finding. Uh, I wish I could quote the article for you. I'm sorry that I can't. Um, but this is really exciting. The image that I was looking at that is stuck in my mind was a painting of a pig. And it had these beautiful um, finger marks pulled all the way through the, the work. And you could just imagine the artist with the, you know, sort of um, okra or whatever they're using to paint with on their hand and drawing the back of their fingertips across the cave wall. Uh, it always delights me and I sort of get goosebumps when I think about the, the practice of making in those caves. I had a question on um, the double negative and the um, oh, some of the different installations that are out in the environment at large. I mean, do people have to get permission in order to do things like this, I would think. Um, yeah. that is, that's on private property, I think, the double negative. Yes. Yeah. Many yeah. of these works that are out in the deserts were on private property. Yeah. Some of them are in public spaces um, and some of them, you know, have been preserved right there. Um, you know, they've been sort of, uh, you know, donated or left in wills, right, so that they can be preserved. I um, see. In perpetuity. Um, you know, I think about Nancy Holtz, um, sun tunnels and such. You know, these works are so interesting because they can't be owned, right, in a sense. Right, they, right. They are, they, in many cases, like, you know, Heisner's work, um, they're literally carved into or out of constructed in these spaces, right? They can't be moved. Um, and so it's really important that we think about how do we get access to this work, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and what does access mean to artists and art patrons, right? And as we move forward, I think about that specifically important in terms of environmental work. If we are trying as artists to think more about the planet, planet as one connected ecology, then everything that we do affects everyone and every being, right? And as we hopefully move away from this androcentric, right, notion of the world where humans are the most important thing, <laughs> um, we begin to think more about how those spaces, right, and those kinds of works influence everything around it, right? Some of that work is so large scale that it changes weather, <laughs> right? Wow. Or it changes the, um, the very ground that we stand upon, right? It, it can do things like, um, you know, change the, um, the sort of the the stability right of the earth and so yeah no those are those are interesting thing questions to ponder and um you know one of my my favorite trips that i planned for students was to head out west and to go camping uh you know in the western landscapes and then hop around to see some of these great earthworks elizabeth did you have a question so as a beekeeper, I was really interested in the cave paintings of the first honey gatherers mm. and that whole that whole thing of art being a way of communicating when there's no written language. Mm -hmm. yes. So the and then the other thing is you didn't mention Cristo as an environmental artist. Yes. Just one of many important people who were left out due to time. Yeah, Christo and, and uh, his wife partner, Jean-Claude, created these amazing works where they often wrapped, if others aren't familiar with this, uh, would wrap buildings or um, islands or put uh, a running fence through the landscape of material to highlight not only the landscape and what we see, but oftentimes to think about what we don't think about, right? What we don't call importance to. And their work was so instrumental and so important, all, partly because of all of the work that went into creating it, right? All the preparatory drawings, all of the legal battles that they went through to secure the locations and be able to put the work in place. Yes, they are very, very important. There's so many people that I left out of this talk. <laughs> I, I was I was really lucky to see their installation in Central Park and it oh. was staggering. It yes. was, yeah. 
Yes. One of my favorite things about Christo and Jean-Claude is the fact that they make these monumental works and then they recycle everything, all of the materials. And they also fund, They, I should say they did fund, both Jean Christ, Christo and Jean-Claude have, have recently passed. Um, they funded their works by selling preparatory drawings um, and you know, creating these small drawings and artist proofs um, for many of their works. And so they were generating this money by people, by big groups of people who were interested in exactly what they were up to, right? Calling this attention to the environment. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Yeah. Uh, this there is the first is of- One <laughs> last question that I'll yeah. get on here. Uh, okay. Janice asks, uh, said, I'm very interested in photography and all things related to sustainability. How do you recommend getting started? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I I think that there are many wonderful photographers who are working in sustainable ways, who are, um, there's a group called the Sustainable Dark Room, who only uses chemistry that they make that is safe for the environment. Um, there are environmental collectives. I'm part of one that's called the Environmental Photography Collective, where we are all women photographers interested in environmental issues and we make work exclusively uh, about the landscape, climate change, environmental causes, uh, while thinking about the ways that our materials affect right, the planet. So um, many of us are using recycled papers, recycled. We're trying to think of new ways of framing our, our works um, and doing installations that maybe don't require framing so that we're not using trees in that sort of way. Um, so that might be a way to get started. Um, also, there are many photographic processes like the cyanotype, which is an early process uh, that was developed in the 19th century, where you can mix together these two chemicals that create a blueprint, and you can literally wash that blueprint anywhere without any you know, environmental harm. And you can make beautiful prints like the early photographer in Atkins, um, she made these botanical prints that, uh, you know, sort of is like, a, what is the word I'm looking for? A collection of these materials, almost like a library um, of seaweeds and plant matter. Um, so that might be an artist that you might be interested in looking at. Yeah, Just Karen. One more thing along the, those lines. There's um, in Batavia, Genesee, Orleans County, they have Go Art and they have an upcoming, they're calling for projects right now or artwork for people that's called This Art is Garbage. And it's supposed to be either made of garbage or depicting garbage or, or whatever, but it just sounded interesting. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. I think we'll uh, end it at that. Thank you, everybody who's still here and look forward to all of you possibly joining us on our next session in February. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Yep. Thank you.